MOU, we realize that our interactive engagement with those in the private sector is not at the level we desire. Because of this, we went ahead and have an MOU with Nasima. Under Nasima, I think about 52 of 50 plus are uh, the various chambers of commerce under Nasima. So by having an MOU with Nasima in terms of task capacity building, education and awareness, we have been able to corner a lot of the various uh, uh, institutions in the private sector. Then we also have another one with outside of the country with Gambia Revenue Authority of the Institute to help in developing administrators from Gambia. They are likely to be coming to Nigeria in respect of this, so that at that point in time, all this relationship I'm talking about are not on charitable basis. Let me be clear on that. There are things that has to do with us building a, an income model around it the, with the sharing formula of 50-50 between us and the various institutions we engage in. Then another one we also did is the one with ICSA. The one with Institute of Charter Secretaries and Administrators of Nigeria has to do with the fact that you cannot be talking corporate governance without talking task governance. Task governance itself is an integral part of corporate governance. So we had this MOU with uh, ICSA to say that, look, anybody that is going to be in charge of corporate governance, she you call it have a good knowledge, not necessarily expert knowledge per se, okay. but good knowledge of tasks, so that that way in advising the board, they are properly guided. Then we went into aspect of strengthening institutions, which is the second thing I want to talk about. At the level of strengthening institutions, it is, it is without doubt a necessity that you cannot strengthen institutions if your policy are defective. So in strengthening our policy framework, we focus on aspect that borders on a lot of things we need to be paying attention to. Starting with the issue of um, MPTP, mandatory professional training program is called mandatory for a reason. Yeah. And because it's a mandatory program, we reviewed, council reviewed the situation and realized that when we have over 25,000 members and only 2,000 of our members or less are getting involved in mandatory professional program, we, at that point, council reviewed it and said, look, if this is mandatory, it is important that members should not go with an egocentric mindset that they know it all. And because you don't know it all, there are bound to be one or two things. Even what you think you know before, there could have been some development there. So we reviewed our policy in that regard. And thereafter, it's created the policy that has to do with making the payment for mandatory ahead of time so that that way you are mindful that is not just about you paying the money. We also want to see you attend. So there are two angles to it, the finance side and the educating side. So we have addressed that this year. Another thing we equally address this year again is the aspect on CIT and CARES. At the level of CIT and care, we realize the times are hard, that's for sure. And um, so many things happen you do not plan for. Debt is one, sickness is another thing. And then you even have people who also want to be socially responsible. At the level of social responsibility, we also realize that at, when we are celebrating our 40th anniversary, it was clear we visited some areas where the refugee camp and all the other things. And we know, notice something. We cannot be talking about an institute like CIT and we don't have a social responsibility. Looking at our social responsibility is our, is our members' responsibility we change the name of the benevolent fund to CI10 Cares. So as of today, that name is CI10 Cares. And in talking about this, we also ensure it is properly funded. We don't create a fund without ensuring that the funding capacity is there. As of today, 10% of the subscription received from members goes to the benevolent aspect, while 2% goes to the social responsibility aspect. As of today, I can tell you on good authority, on one or two occasions we even intervene positively ahead of uh, so many other bodies when it comes to our response to our members in distress. Then we have the issue of anniversary fund. If you recall my distinguished members, you will see that we 40 seems to have caught us on our ways and it is not supposed to be so. We celebrated our 40th anniversary because of our resilience. We were able to fund it effectively. 
But we were mindful that after 40, sooner or later, the institute will achieve 50. We will talk 60, we will talk 70, and so on. So we need to be planned for such anniversary so that it doesn't look as something that is catching us on our wheels. So we created an anniversary fund that will be properly funded so that by the time we are clocking maybe 50 or any other year we didn't fit, we will realize that the fund already has enough resources to make us go through without us going through the operational uh, fund model. We also look at a district building support fund. Our district is our strength. As of today, we have districts in 33 states of the Federation and also the Federal Capital Territory. So we have only three more states to go to cover the whole of Nigeria. And because our model of governance is tilted more towards strengthening our district society, because they are in touch with the grassroots. Our objective is that at the national level, you may not be able to see a lot of things, but at the district level, the district are in touch with what is happening at that level. So and we are also mindful of the fact we want to make our district self-sustaining. We don't want them to be coming cup in hand, cup in hand to meet us for purpose of um, uh, resources. And one of the districts that has taken uh, the initiative effectively here yeah, is the KB District Society. And when we look at this, we realize we need to support them in terms of the building they are coming up with. So the Institute created the District Building Support Fund. And that building support fund means at the level of, we have a model for all the district to adopt. At the level of Linter, we agreed we are going to give 5 million naira for any district that has been able to make that progress to that level. And like the Yoruba proverb says, it is the child that raises, raises up his or her hand that the parent will carry. So we want all our district to be more proactive and intentional about the future. Then we have the aspect of our, of our society of women in taxation. The suite is also something, because when you realize that CIT, you always use the word, we have tax men, but we are mindful of the fact that we have women too, who have decided to go into this tax world of revenue, I mean, tax professionalism. So we have it at the beginning of this administration that we must expand the suite too, also to all the states, of the Federation. We inherited about 10 when this administration started. We've been able to add another seven to it. So we have 17 state chapters of SWIT as of today. At the SWIT level again, we realize that God gave us, I mean, by divine confidence, the name we call our women is Society of Women in Transition. And we are mindful of the fact that in the West African region, there are also women in taxation. So why don't we become the evangelists of this initiative and start informing other countries? Come up with your own society of women in taxation. We did this and at uh, council level, we resolved that this should be driven by WAUTI, West African Union of Tax Institute. We were able to get in touch with West African Union of Tax Institute and ECOWAS, and they gave support to this. To show you the level of uh, achievement in that regard, as at August this year, we were able to have Society of Women in Transition Ghana coming on board. By September, just a few days ago, the Society of Women in Transition Senegal has equally come on board. So Nigeria is actually the initiator of this, but we are not financially involved technically because ECOWAS and WAUTI are actually helping us to drive this within the uh, West African region. Then another thing I want to say briefly too, still on this, has to do with um, the brand image. At the brand level, we realize we need to be strengthening our brand. If you recall, during my predecessor's period, we changed the logo. The logo was changed, a beautiful logo as of today, beautiful to, for you to look at. And we said beyond the change of logo, we should now talking about strengthening all those things and also ensuring our corporate communication is strengthened. And part of this initiative is this CIT and transition on you. And we still have this secondary part of it that has to do with the fact that with as far as the profession we belong to is concerned, we must know what is happening all over the country. 
and you will see that connecting that with the DC society being strengthened, which means we will know what is happening in 36 plus one state. So we shouldn't just sit in Lagos and say we know what is happening all over the nation. So with that, we believe that our bad image made us to actually strengthen the corporate communication app, and it is still an ongoing process. So I can assure you that before the end of this administration, we also do one or two things that will show that we are committed to the corporate communication part of the, uh, of the Institute. Now, still talking on uh, remodeling the Institute, for those people who are familiar with uh, the tax professional house, one or two things at the level of entry and at the level of council's uh, uh, chamber requires us to actually ensure that the image you want to project to members is that image that shows our faithfulness to our brand and the fact that we also want a situation where they will be proud of the type of perception of the institute is trying to project. So we're actually addressing that. Then at the academy level, the TAS Academy has come to stay. I can tell you the TAS Academy from the perspective of self-financing as of today is generating enough in order for it to be regarded as self-sustaining. And beyond that, well, in the course of our visitation to some of the states, we were Privilege and how can, how can I put it against a uh, favored at the Kwara state level? We have two land one in the Air one in Amoyo, which is meant to be the base of our task academy from the infrastructural perspective. At Akwaibom level, when we visited the government, they also gave us a land which is meant to also serve as a hub for the south south aspect of the academy. We are presently in touch with the Casina district and they have also promised us another one which will also serve as at the hub for the north northern uh, area so it means that at the level of virtual engagement and physical engagement we are gradually laying the foundation to make sure that anytime we are talking about the academy people will not need to travel far in order to have access to what we want either we want to talk about virtual or physical. We are going to have further conversation on this in terms of even the hybrid model as we proceed. That's um, in terms of that. Finally, to so make this clear, we are mindful that CITN at 40 is equally still a growing institute. And beyond that, you will equally be aware of one or two things we have been able to do, talking generational impact. Generational impact now means we should be talking to the youth. And in talking to the youth, we also need to be talking to those in the schools. So we had a visitation with um, uh, the NYSC. And in talking about that, we had a quick understanding instantly. And they were favored by the DG. The director general who gave yes to all the prayers we made. And in doing this, we look at it. How do we ensure that people who are at the level of their finished university, they are about coming into the real world? How do we engage them to make sure that when they come into the real world, they are coming into the right side of the world? So, because that was done, we are as at now, we have a draft MOU which we are likely to see a closure to with AYC. That's in terms of that. So that as the level of camping, we are already there talking to them as an institute. Then the other one again is the fact that we set up ANTAS, Association of Nigerian TAS Students. is an initiative of CITN. And at that level too, we were mindful of one thing. We, we cannot leave the institutional growth to chance. We must be deliberate, we must be intentional. And because of that, we set up ANTAS. And at the level of ANTAS, we have been able to make sure that the patron of ANTAS is the chairman of Federal Island Revenue Service, we call it double as the chairman of JTB, and the president of the Chartered Organization of Nigeria in their role as chairman and, uh, uh, chairman and president. So we have been able to build a framework around this 
to make sure that the issue of tax development is a deliberate strategy of CIT. Then the other aspect, again, that we are addressing is the fact that beyond the tertiary level, we should be able to talk about what is happening at secondary. In fact, the, if I'm able to read the mood of my council very well, not to even stop off from even getting to the level of primary school. Okay. So we are now looking at the secondary aspect that will create the awareness at secondary school level. And before you know what is happening, by the time they are talking about what less they need to do, our institute will be occupying a pride of place in their uh, scale of preference. These are all areas where uh, we are looking at. And I can assure you, uh, me, while I'm open to some other questions in terms of what, other, what comes up, areas that borders on the soft side of our institute is equally undergoing attention. And I can assure you that we are making progress in that regard. Too. So while I wait, my members wow, come wow, well, thank thank you quite, a mouthful, quite a mouthful. Um, so many great things said within, uh, within the 20 minutes and thereabouts. And um, before we go to our members to ask them to ask questions, make contributions, and um, suggest, and um, also join in this uh, the future building for society as a young max. This is the second anniversary tomorrow to the period of October 1, 2022. There are four areas that I want you to look your discussion to. Number one, what is the state of examination? Integrity of examination, what is the state? And what is the structure of the robustness of our syllabus to ensure we are churning out a market ready, professionally um, um, graduates that will join the pool of the transition workforce? Uh, thank you very much, Oji. Let me, let me put it this way. Um, when it comes to examination process, you find out that while you are, you are trying to meet up with technology, that's number one, you are trying to meet up with contemporary issues, which is number two, and you're also trying to make sure that the people you bring out are market ready. Because CITN is not a theoretical team. By the time you say you are a shattered task practitioner or you're a task professional, you don't get to an organization and start looking for what is not lost. Once you, get, once you see that, they expect you to come out firing from all cylinder as a professional. Now, at the level of examination, which we are also in touch with um, ACCA is another one where we have MOU with, and we are equally mindful a lot of our people within the institute are people who are in the practice world because it's find out they are in, in, in a leading firm and they are also in uh, administration. So when, and these are the people again, along with those in the academic world, the academic. So we bring them all together informing our uh, examination committee. Okay. So in our examination committee focuses and there is a review process to be, able to make sure that the type of question we're asking is not yesterday's question. Actually, the examination system as of today is already answering, asking tomorrow's questions. What are we doing in terms of so many things like OECD? What are we doing on transfer pricing? What is happening in terms of our VAT world? We want our students to think critically. The critical thinking part is necessary and essential because we don't want a situation where you regurgitate what you learned. We want you to be able to understand that when it comes to some of these issues, case study is playing a major role. So when you are already having a simulation in terms of case study, by the time you get into the real world and you are seeing the case study, which is now the real world, you'll be able to cope effectively. So I can assure you that our examination is receiving attention. But let me also say something. One of the concerns of a lot of people is this. If our examination process is receiving so much attention. What happened in terms of this direct admission? And naturally, in the course of looking at some of these, you find out that the issue of admission process and the issue of examination process has been an issue that has been recurring on consistent basis. Now, what differentiates the two? For us to say anybody is qualified for direct admission, you're already a member of a professional body. Precisely as of today, we are talking about Anand Icon. Now, for you to have even qualified in those professional bodies, you went through some process. So the only gap we are trying to close for you 
is the gap between your profession and the tax award. And because those gaps are something that has to now do with, will you be able to meet the criteria for us to even admit you in the first place? That is where we do pre-induction. And after the pre-induction, we always make it very clear. Tax is a developing thing. You will always see that what you know yesterday, you must find a way of either or learning it in order to relearn, I mean, to learn new things about that. We are talking about pillar one, pillar two, for example. We are going to have a conversation on this very soon. We want to know why. Why is it that we are not going the way of the world? Or why? Or what did we see differently that we think others did not see? This is the area that brothers on the father, as a task professional, your thinking process must be high in order for you to be able to see what others will not see. Because tax is about money. And if you miss it at the first list, you will end up paying more than you are supposed to pay. And if you don't get it right, you get the penalty for not doing it right. So it is a sensitive one. Our examination process is critical to us. Well, thank you, Dr. Thank you for that wonderful explanation and our incisive uh, and perspective to what some people, some of our members, and even the public, do not know about our, our, our process. Um, I passed through the taxation examination site and I become a member ACTI and all of that. Now I need to work, career, a profession, I need to follow through. What is the state of our certificates in the public sector, in private sector? In particular, because they want to go to consulting and all that is it's really safe for what? Well, in the typical government ministry, department agency, what is the status of our certificates as compared to appropriate placement, recognition, and reward in the hierarchy? Thank you very much. Let me say something. Um, this conversation on the state of our certificate has also been a recurring one. And I can put it on good authority, even at the level of APBN, something came from the head of service and we are engaging them on consistent basis because it's something that has to do with all professional bodies. But let me narrow down, come down home to that of CIT. When you see somebody who is a tax professional, the first point of call is that I want to work in internal revenue service, I want to work in inland revenue service. So that means there is a direction of thought. But things have changed between that period when the only place where you can easily assume you will be beyond being in the professional firm is in this area. We, our engagement recently has even made it clear that we are closer to being compliance officers, even in a lot of TLCs. That's number one. You are, I mean, in terms of even so many small and medium enterprises, these are the areas where even the need for you to have, if you can have internal auditor and have external auditor, it shows the importance that is being placed on audit process. So if we have an internal compliance officer, as far as tax is concerned, re regulatory issue, that is there, and we have the issue of the tax professional practitioners also supporting that, it is clear that we also need to also be working on the private sector side. But now the ministry part, which is the aspect that borders on the end of service, as of today, the circle we have see shows that our certificate is recognized. The most recent one that is coming from the office of the head of civil service, we are now engaging at the level of association of professional bodies with the head of service for purpose of seeing this. The last meeting we had recently, a committee, was set up to actually have direct engagement with the office of the head of service. I'm talking about the Association of Professional Bodies now, in order to make sure that the issue, the latest circular, talking about the fact that professional uh, certification will not be recognized as a result of one or two things, we want to take it up. Because you see, you cannot talk about professionalism and restrict it only to the aspect that borders on the last academic qualification. Things change. Right before our very eyes, I am a member of this institute about, let's say, uh, 29 years ago, 28, 29. And between the period I became a member and now, a lot of things are changing in the tax world, from the administrative part, from the legal part, from the policy framework. 
So you cannot be using yesterday's knowledge to move Nigeria into tomorrow's world. It is not possible. So these are all areas we want to have this engagement to make it clear that that issue of that circular that comes on recently should be reviewed. But there is this one that borders on the recognition of our certification in the relevant place, especially in internal revenue service and federal revenue service, is still valid. Well, yeah, thank you, Mr. President. That is very assuring to, for our members out there and our viewers to know that the sector we are carrying is worth a whole lot. And then we see the prime, the numeral, um, you know, you know, uh, you know, numeral you know, when it comes to um, the practice and the action of taxation in Nigeria. We are going to open up the lines. Um, we have um, about one and a half hours to ensure we, we get in all questions, all comments, all observations. So we are going to do it this way. We are going to take those whose pumps are up and we we'll take them. We we'll open up the chat to look at the questions in the chat. So take some. It's going to be a hybrid of those um, voicing their contributions, questions, and those who have um, typed in um, messages. So start with those who will stand up. I can see a PC. Um, okay. And my producer is um, guiding me that I need to take the chat first. Um, so, so I'll come back to those who are up. So, um, so someone is asking, you did not mention Accra in your conversation. What is the institute doing about joint? You did not mention so SCCA in your conversation. What is the institute doing about joining SCCA as a member of CIT and SAC? I repeat, Mr. President, just for you to get it again. You did not mention SCCA. That is the Mr. Um, Adebayo saying, you don't know SCCA in your conversation. What is the institute doing about joining SCCA as a member of site and sir? So, Mr. President, um, you may want to clarify that. I think I'm uh, but you go ahead, sir, Mr. President. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, sorry, that was an oversight, but at the same time, I was trying to restrict myself. So what has happened in this administration? ACCA and uh, CIT has a MOU before this administration, and it has been a, a very uh, benevolent and symbiotic one. Let me put it that way. I may, I'm mindful of the fact that at a point in time, ACCA is helping us even to strengthen our examination process. Uh, talking about the beneficial effects, when you talk about SEC, you are talking about people who are in the accounting profession. The same thing that happens with our relationship with Anna. At that level, it means that if you are a member of CIT and you, your first feed happens to be accountancy, then you have, we can easily talk about relationship with SCCA for you. Because the first leg to a bit is the fact that this is the accounting profession and some of their members, not all ECCA members, some of their members are desirous of being members of CIT. So it means that for you to now come into CIT, there are some things you must get right. You must get the Nigerian law right. You must get the Nigerian tax system correctly. So that is why we have that initial MOU. Now, if somebody is now worried accounting and we have CIT, now wants to also be a member of ACCA, then it means that naturally, because their primary feed is accountancy, which is not our own major feed as a person, there is a process of examination you still go to. You'll be exempted from some, but you will not, it will not be a direct thing for that level. And those, those are the areas where I can okay. say that we have. And then ACCA is equally uh, having uh, something to do with us uh, very soon. I think it's coming up in October. Because part of what we both agree is that Nigeria is our immediate focus. And because Nigeria is our immediate focus, we should be talking more about what both institutes can do in order to add value to the governance process of the country. So which is the area at which we are likely to have a combined uh, a workshop in the next few weeks. Okay, thank you, Mr. Brother, to elaborate on that one. So let me take a Priscilla. Um, I may not get your uh, prefaces correctly, whether Mrs. Dr. Professor, but pardon us. Priscilla, you may, you may, you may, I will speak to the president. Priscilla.
You see, like, are you there? If you're there, you may, you may speak, if you're muted, you may speak to the president, Priscilla. Okay, let's move on. Um, what's the name of the other person? Okay, Priscilla, you're there. If you're not audible, go ahead. Go ahead, Priscilla. Okay. Okay, so I wanted to ask, there are associations for people inside the Nigeria for taxation. What about those who are not inside Nigeria, but still uh, is interested in Nigeria taxation uh, for work purposes or for professional purposes? Uh, Priscilla, I don't think we got to tell me. Are you talking about you not being in Nigeria? And uh, or can you quickly, just succinctly, um, repeat what you said? And probably, um, you know, slowly so I can get it. Priscilla, please. Okay, so what I'm trying to say is that the associations for um, professionals in taxation in Nigeria, what about those? who are not in Nigeria, so they are not Nigerians, they are not in Nigeria as well. Okay. But then they are also interested in taxation Nigeria or CITN and, and they want okay. to be part. Is there any association for them that speaks on their behalf? Or is there any way that they can easily reach their uh, the association? Okay, okay. okay. Fusilla, so are you Nigerian? Are you Nigerian? Or are you a Nigerian based outside of Nigeria? Okay, so I'm not a Nigerian, I'm a Ghanaian. I'm a Ghanaian based in Ghana. But then I, I'm also interested in um, Nigeria taxation. Uh, wow, 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 wow. Thank you so much. You are speaking to the best person in this who can answer your concern. Trying to reach the assistant. Okay, thank you, Priscilla. Your point is gotten. Mr. President, Priscilla is a Ghanaian based in Ghana. She's interested in taxation about Nigeria. She's interested in CIT. Nigeria is the biggest country in Africa in all ramifications, apart from the issue. So that's already sounding the weights. You know, we are Africa, Nigeria is Africa, right? Nigeria is Africa. So it has to be the pointer. What I really want to do high, as I said, I want to write the exam. I'm not in Nigeria. I'm not in Nigeria, but I want to write Nigerian tax based examination because I feel Nigeria has a lot to offer. How can I go about it? That's what Priscilla is asking. Uh, thank you, Priscilla, for our bigger because some of the questions, that's why I said that this is a good one for us. Some of the issues we have not been paying a lot of attention to are equally now showing that we need to. Now, before I even answer Priscilla's question, uh, we are all mindful of the fact that Africa. Uh, continental free trade agreement okay. is on. Yes. And by the time the effect starts even showing itself, we'll be having a situation where there is this issue of uh, uh, the mobility of so many things becomes what we are dealing with. Now, secondly, at the, I don't have the statistics, but you will agree with me too that at the West African level, the population of Nigeria is the dominant one. And if there is any institute that should be focused on ensuring that the knowledge of what happens in the Nigerian system is something we ensure goes everywhere. I mentioned something earlier uh, that we are gradually involved in the capacity building MOU with yes. Gambia Revenue Authority. Yes, indeed. And we were also the one that has actually created the awareness of society of monetization and two countries have jumped on board, which is Ghana and uh, Senegal. The only aspect we have not factored in is the one that Priscilla just mentioned. Mm -hmm. How do we start talking about our student population outside of Nigeria? Nigeria. Yeah. We, we are in conversation with the Shatters of Transition Ghana earlier, relating to even this issue of a, a qualification mix. Okay. okay. How does somebody who has CIT and uh, CITN has what it takes for purpose of being able to get the relevant one? At the level of when uh, President Aflu was there, we made it, uh, it's an appreciable level of progress. But as of today, it is stalled. That's one. So I want to 
just put it on record that we are yet to talk about outside of the country for purpose of our examination. But with what Priscilla has just said, I think I will take it to my council. I will treat it as a priority. By ensuring that beyond the country, we should also be talking about people within the West African region, specifically, who are desirous of having the certification of Nigeria, so that our examination process will accommodate, but it is also based on the fact that it is cost effective. We accommodate students who are outside of the country. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you so much um, for that response. Too. Um, we can see. Um, is that a name to the farm being raised up? Okay, let's take a question. Someone is asking, that is um, Barrister uh, Nenna, if I'm correct, Nenna Eze. She's asking, um, uh, she's greeting good morning, Mr. President, and official colleagues. Um, okay, okay, well, that's a recommendation, that's a coordination. Um, thank you, Barrister Nenna Eze. Someone is asking, sir, that is Mr. Chris. Baba, is it Baba Bala? Pardon me. He says, I'm a member of Anan and I've consistently received emails from sites, which is like, okay, that's, uh, that's uh, you, know, uh, you know, a plus. Someone is asking, how or who can I contact for the certificate course in the Tax Academy? Do we have any other venue for lecture apart from the academy's office? Um, for the academy, who can um, um, our um, viewer okay. contacts? Yeah, for the academy, you can contact Mrs. Yetunde Sulaiman. Mrs. Yetunde Sulaiman is the acting DG of the academy. Now, let me also say something in terms of the certificate course. We have it, it is an ongoing thing. But presently, the issue of uh, uh, um, engagement is virtual. As of today, it's virtual. Okay. Uh, virtual, we are having more virtual engagement because the academy, in terms of uh, infrastructure and whatever, is still part of, is still in the, at the planning stage. But the one in Lagos, which we are likely to do with Gambia Revenue Authority, since they are coming from outside of Lagos, that one will take place in task professionals in Lagos. Okay. Yeah. But the one for a lorry presently, we are yet to finish that aspect of uh, uh, infrastructure development. So what we do is that for the various courses, it's technically virtual, okay. like the various certificate courses. Okay, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for that um, clarification. This is Yetunde so, Sulaiman, is the okay. a, a person you get in touch with. She's the acting DG of the academy. Okay, Mr. Yetunde Sulaiman is acting DG of the you know, CIT and Tax Academy, CTA get in touch, go to the website and um, get all the information you need to for follow up. And also all the courses um, currently are virtually available, you can access them from any part of the world. Even when the procedure that asks from Ghana, if you want to take, select a bouquet of courses, she can also join yeah. through the um, through the Times Academy that is virtual while we uh, work on other things. Now, I'm somebody asking, um, um, Mr. President, Mr. Okay, that is uh, Patricia. <laughs> Mr. President, you have a lot to do with today. I requested for certain stamps for over a month now. <laughs> and up to now, we haven't heard from the Institute for Collection. Patricia will be number 2673. Um, I think what I'm I don't know whether you have something to say in that regard, or um, if you have a unit you can refer her to. She has her stamps over a month now. Uh, do you really the interaction? Yes. And then she hasn't heard from anyone. Yeah. The, the person you are going to relate to it, I want to believe that even by the time we are through with this, the contact of a lot of people at the level of the secretariat should be put on the screen. Okay. So that the person you are relating with is Mr. Robert Ibodio, is the head of membership. And uh, it, is, it is disheartening. Let me put it that way. Because you see, the comments that this thing has been on for close to a year plus, shows that the aspect of our effective uh, communication as a corporate entity is not yet uh, giving the desired result. Because as much as possible, this is not something that should even get to the level of presidency. I want to believe so. So, and um, based on what you just said, I, we have uh, a conversation later 
with the registrar chief executive to make sure that most of those things should be out in the public domain so that they will be getting it on a regular basis and know who to talk to and not wait until when we have a president coming on board before you now address something as basic as stamp. I believe we have sufficient and this shouldn't be something as an institute we should be debating or discussing that you ask and you cannot get. So how can you practice effectively if you ask and you did not receive what you need to work well? I'm sorry about that. I can assure you my conversation with the registrar later today will address a lot of these concerns. Thank you, Mr. President. Someone asked me a question, but I think you've answered it. I'll largely um, um, allow you about the state of research and certificate. Um, in your earlier, you clarified private public sector. And I think that's about that. Let's go to Mr. Adejumo. Adejumo. A Adejumo. A, yes, A Adejumo. You may unmute and speak. The president is here live. Go ahead, unmute and speak, please, Mr. A Adejumo. Are you there? Mr. Adejima, are you there? Can you hear us? OK, let's go around to Mr. Joshua. Um, we can't see the full name. Uh, Mr. Joshua, if you are there, you're mute to speak with the president. Is he alive and direct? Mr. Joshua, you're muted. Go ahead. Okay, I hope we are not having an um, um, issue with the sound. Uh, our members, okay, those who are. Uh, okay, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, louder, please. Um, okay, Mr. Olusha Son Okwade. Mr. Richard O'Quanda, are you there? If you are there, you will need to speak with the president. Is he alive? Good, good morning, my president. Good morning. Good morning, our host. Uh, very good initiative on the part of our president. My concern and uh, the question I want to put the, to the president, what is the Institute doing in catching them young? And what are the programs that are actually enlisted out uh, for the Gen Z generation? I'm sure the president is uh, one of us. Gen Z generation are the one we literally call the Sorosuke generation, tech serve, and everything we do. It's, uh, we operate in the cloud. My host uh, understand better. So what are the plans? Because it, that, that's a big gap between the older generation and the generations that some of us belong to. What is the Institute doing uh, to make sure that this gap is closed and we are not cut out of the system? Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Ijoba, uh, Sheso. Uh, nice hearing from you. Let me, let me just talk about what we have done and what we intend to do. Uh, as at last year's, up to this year, we are engaged in talking about even of um, uh, issues that borders on uh, debate, tax related debate. At the level of uh, secondary school, if I have to put it that way, the program I went for in New York that led to the Aquaribon State uh, Government giving us uh, the plot of land we mentioned has to do with secondary school related debates. And at that debate, that is under Dr. Titi Foroko. Uh, she is the person with the share of our uh, student affairs. And at that debate, we, we have even beyond our expectation in terms of what we got, because the chairman of Aquaribon State uh, Internal Revenue also gave one or two scholarships, if I could recall, in addition to the various prizes we gave to the lady who came first, the young lady who came first in terms of that debate. So that those are ones. We have had that of the South-South like twice or thrice relating to those secondary school related debates. And we also have this issue of um, uh, professor, uh, this, uh, the professor who is helping us, I think he's a member, who is equally helping us on this, I can't easily recall. So that's one. 
So we have a membership support. Our members support us in this initiative, and we're having institutional support. So relating to secondary school, that's the Sorosuke part you mentioned. Now, the second part of your question that has to do with how do we ensure we do not leave a generation behind? It is a very critical one because when you see, uh, when you see, even if I'm looking that young, when you see, <laughs> <laughs> when you see the fact that the, if you have a generation matrix and you find out that the future of this country is resting on most of those people we call this Gen Z, then there is a need for them to have the understanding of some principles so that their initiative and innovation, when it's not based on the solid principle, we cannot be talking about experiencing a new country going forward as far as revenue is concerned. So it is very critical. Otherwise, we are more or less going to just uh, uh, atrophy and die if we do not take them into consideration. Now, the aspect, again, that we must consider, which as an institute we are taking into play, has to do with the fact that the use of technology is higher in the generation you are mentioning. Okay. While in our own case, we are struggling to just even be literate as far as technology is concerned. So in order to bring them on board, there must be an extensive use of technology from the engagement to the aspect of learning to the aspect of application. So we are mindful of all this, and therefore I can assure you as an institute, we are highly focused on this generation. Then thirdly, for those who qualified as past professional that find themselves below 40, we have a deliberate policy initiated by Association of Professional Bodies that we must start getting them and making sure that their ideas, their innovation, the level of thinking that goes on relating to task development, we start harnessing them in order to develop the institute. So we have it as a deliberate policy that those who are below this certain age who we have, we must start putting them together to ensure that the ideas comes on board and we're able to leverage that idea and make progress. Thank you, Mr. President. I think that does justice to that. Um, we have uh, Mr. Elijah um, Oceano. Oceano, Mr. Elijah, you are meet and speak. The village is here for your life. Mr. President, I, I salute you this morning. I greet you too. And uh, Ogazan, I greet you too. Thank you, sir. Uh, this, is, this is a very good development and uh, it couldn't have come at a better time. And uh, I'm happy the way you guys have been uh, leading the Institute and uh, we have become very visible now among our peers. We've become very, very visible. And that is the way to go. Uh, to follow up with uh, what uh, my colleague had just uh, uh, the questions he, he asked, I want I want I want to I want to drive it down to the universities. Uh, apart from Bangkok University, I'm not sure there is any other university that has that has task curricula that has um, uh, a seat, professorial seat for transition. Because this program, this will drive it from the school. When they are coming out, they come out with that, with that spirit. So what effort are we making uh, through the universities to ensure that these programs are, uh, these, these things are in the curricula of universities? And uh, how have we been able to drive this down to, through the NUC that has the, the powers to uh, include uh, the subject of taxation or the, the, uh, in the schools, because I'm aware that in most schools, uh, you have taxation under account department and uh, maybe in ad administration, uh, school of administration and the rest of them. So I need you to throw more light on that, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Let me, let me separate the questions into two. The issue of tertiary institutions that offer a degree in transition, I think we have a lot of them now. Maybe a little okay. we'll have it. Yes, we have a lot of them. So, and uh, I can easily recall one. Nassau State University, for example, I'm aware, and I think so many. Federal that, Protective Network there. Uh -huh. Federal University, you would say, in Jigawa State, okay. they also. So they are also, so that's one. But 
Now I'm back to the first question, which I'm now answering next. The one that borders on the professor I share. Let me let me give uh, one or two caveats. Uh, CI10 is a is a membership based organization. It's an MBO, if I have to put it that way. So which means the resources we are spending are resources that belong to members. So while we are mindful of that, we, we despite the challenges we have on the financing side, we went ahead to have a professorial share on transition, which is presently being occupied by Professor Ishola Rufos Akitoi of Babcock. So that is the one. And then when you look at it, it has been very wonderful, if I have to put it that way, because the level of resources we need to have expended on it, because it happens to be our member, and a lot of these things are being even done selflessly, we, we are not spending so much on the level of the development we envisage from that professor at this but we are getting a lot of mileage there. Now, the challenge going forward is the fact that, one, can we have so many of these things in terms of professor share? The answer is, I doubt it, because of the aspect that borders on the uh, financing. If, you, if I show you the financial statement and you look at the aspect of subscription, you will know that if we do not be, use a lot of initiative in talking about generating revenue, we will find it difficult to operate. But be that as it may, a lot of some of these initiatives we are still doing it, but we are doing it at a level that is not what we would have wanted to do, assuming the resources are limitless or very, or very or we have a lot of it. But what you said relating to this are issues again that made us some years ago to start talking about the academy, which is where we are paying a lot of attention because part of our primary focus, focus is to talk about capacity building. And for a country like Nigeria, you will agree with me, building capacity is critical. In fact, we should declare a state of emergency on the aspect of capacity building. If we don't have the capacity, we can't take the country to the next level because we'll be suffering from ignorance. And ignorance itself is an affliction of the mind. So if you take it with me, you will realize that it is us now building that capacity and ensuring that we connect the generation. As we are talking about the capacity at the higher level, we are equally mindful of building the same capacity from the secondary level, if need be, and even possible go beyond that. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, let's go to Mr. Jodo Okunola. Mr. Jodo Okunola, if you are there, you are already on. Are, are you, you, are, you may speak, please. Mr. Jodo Okunola. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you can hear me now. Clearly, clearly, perfectly. Good. Um, thank you to the President and to CITN for this opportunity. I must mention that I'm not a tax professional as background, but I'm part of the U that um, I believe this platform is for. Um, I, 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 manage, I run a business, and as a result of that, I get involved with the FIRS, which is the major tax um, authority for the country. And so this is a good platform to air this opinion and also to ask the president what you're doing with regards um, to the methods the FIRS uses to take out um, taxes from um, businesses, small businesses. You would, if you, if you would do research, you would find out that most often you have small businesses paying most of the taxes in the country while the larger companies have their ways out of the books. Um, the FIRS holds us, especially those who are project-based companies who would usually want their tax clearance at the start of every year so they can do business. So they hold you to ransom with all manner of techniques, right? Unprofessional many times to make sure they get money out of you. Um, they recently put up the tax pro max, which was a blessing in disguise, like we said. That was a good was a good initiative because it gives you the visibility with regards to your withholding credit notes that your contract employers deduct and also VAT that they deduct from source. In the past, sometimes it was a whole lot of hassle when you have to go get in your credit notes to from the contract employer and all the stories of delay that they would claim on the FIRS. 
Now, there are still issues underlining in this same regard. Government agencies not remitting taxes as at when due or remitting at all. And the FIRS still putting that burden on the taxpayer who is supposed to be placing his or her business, searching for new business to go chasing government tax agents to get proof of payment of these taxes. I don't know what the CITN is doing regarding this, how your engagement with the FIRS is. Uh, is the FIRS becoming more open to taxpayers? We want the country to get more taxes. We want the country to grow with revenue, but we don't want more businesses to close as a result of the FIRS strangulating those businesses. And finally, um, is the CITN looking to take non um, tax um, background professionals, meaning those who have studied accounting, finance, and the related um, courses into membership, but maybe associate members, because some of us, by virtue of running businesses, have almost become tax professionals, even though we've not had to write any exams. You know, we've been forced to go and read so much about taxes, ask our auditors so many questions, and you know, some of them are wondering, why do you want all this knowledge? But we want to be informed, <laughs> like you said. Gen Z people are information driven and they don't like to just take answers without getting facts behind the answers. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. I think uh, this is a good one. Um, I, will, I will start this way, starting from the first one where you mentioned that the methods used by FRS. I, let, me, let me be blunt here. As a Nigerian, as a citizen, as a president of an institute. One of the challenges I consider that is militating against our development has to do with the issue of data. The provision of information, data. We, as a country, we are, we are not too sure what our population is. Is it 200 million, is it 201, is it 210? We're having that confusion. As a Professional again, I, I would have loved to know how many companies we really have, how many of them have closed down, how many of them are going through receivership, how many of them have been incorporated that have not even gone close to corporate affairs commission. That would be good information for me. I'm still talking data. And as a person again, who is a practitioner now, I would have loved to know how much of withholding taxes. Some of us who are even practitioners, it may not be at the level of your business uh, growth, for example, but even as a professional, I would love a situation where somebody would decided to deduct withholding tax from my income, remit same to the relevant tax authority, because it's my income. You deduct withholding tax, it's not your money. You are supposed to deduct it and remit to the appropriate authority, whether it is the state internal revenue, or the Federal Land Revenue Service. I would love to have that. Those are issues I would like to know. And then thirdly, you see, the principle behind withholding tasks is straightforward. If you did not withholding tasks from me and you did not get to Lagos State Internal Revenue Service, I cannot go and knock on their door and tell them that, look, these taxes have been deducted, you can't ask me to pay more. The starting point will be for me to go to that particular client who the doctor withholding tax and did not remit. Otherwise, I have another option to inform the tax office that these are the areas where I have done businesses withholding tax the doctor. So please, you go after them. But I can assure you, as Nigerians, even at most at professional level, some of us are very emotional about things like this. You won't want to report your clients in the cause of telling them they took money from me and did not remit. So by failing to do that, you are going to find yourself on the other side again in the law. But you mentioned something which I have to actually address. And it has to do with the approach. I can tell you the level of training, the level of development a lot of the administrators go through puts them in a position where their service delivery is effective. Whether this method now is that now, look at it in some cases. I have a case in point without mentioning name. This was a case where the auditor, I will just give you that case and attend to that question. Where the auditor finished doing his job on the basis of limited information, 
And because of exchange of information agreement between the FRS and some uh, foreign bodies, they got information that that particular company also has uh, accounts in those places. So what did they do? The next question is, so has the auditor, did you, have you considered this? If the answer is yes, then you have no problem. If the answer is no, then there's a need for you to have a conversation. Because in, the, in their own case, they are the blind one. You are the one who knows where your DC is coming from. And you are presumed in this particular case, unlike the other one, you are presumed guilty if you cannot provide answers relating to what borders on your income. So use of technology is putting a lot of things in place, which I can assure you as you go ahead. And naturally, talking about engagement between us and FRS, the truth of the matter is that unlike some radical-based organization, our type of organization is conservative. So the starting point is for us to have consistent engagement, because even in our council, we have the representative of the executive chairman, Federal Land Revenue Service, on the council. So it means a lot of concerns we have, just like you mentioned now, are issues we can easily discuss, get relevant this thing, relevant engagement, and be able to address. The one we mentioned on ProMass, for example, you realize that in the course of strengthening this issue, CIT was at the forefront of talking about the challenges in the implementation, and these are being addressed. So I can assure you these are areas we will operate in, because it has to do with the law, it has to do with the administration, it has to do with policy. The second part of your question that has to do with, do we have routes where other non tax people can come into the system? The answer is a yes and no. I will answer it this way. You economists, lawyers, all these other things, we have a route where you must first show us you've been involved in this, including even a comprehensive CV. So it is at the review at that level, which is reviewed by ESCO, that we can look at what you have done, whether there is a need for us to, based on what you have done relating to this field, whether there is a route we can ask you to go through in order to become an associate member. And if you do not belong to any of the institutes where we have an MOU presently, then it means that we must consider each case on a case-by-case -case basis. But I can assure you, put together your CV. If it is a businessman who knows everything about us, I would love to see that. So that at the end of the day, when we are now considering, we will take all that into consideration to tell, let you know, maybe you can go through this route. You can do only one level, if need be. Assuming you have all the experience we want in the other side, we can reduce your level to one. And if necessary, we can tell you there's another route you can go through. So I can assure you, put that together and, as an institute, we don't throw anything away. We pay attention to it. Yeah, right. thank you, Mr. President. Uh, you can see that, uh, you know, when um, someone calls our president agents, you president, the very thing you want to prevent, <laughs> even though it's sad beyond what I know, we can see why it's called agency. <laughs> you can connect with us. We go to Mr. Sam, Omar for you. Yes, Mr. Sam, what for Joey? If you are there, you know, meet and speak. The president is here for you. Okay. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, uh, our president. Good afternoon. And uh, uh, thank you for this uh, initiative. I, my question uh, is about uh, what is uh, CITN doing as an institute to also caution the government about how to judiciously use the fund generated for some tax proceed. I know the government has been, push, push, has been putting to us as an institute to help advocate and also ensure we have to generate, you know, to concertize a citizen to, you know, to pay their tax as a when due. What are we also doing as an institute to also uh, charge the government to ensure that money coming in for tax are judiciously used for the purpose instead of all this uh, privilege and uh, diversion of fund that is you know synonymous uh, with, with, uh, with the government. Uh, thank you once again for the audience. Sir. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sam. Uh, I think I love this one. And then um, I remember when this administration was coming on board, 
June last year, one of the uh, first thing we put, and it was documented, is that our focus, and it's not even restricted to the council's focus, all members of the institute, is about how do we generate revenue? How are we generating revenue? Very critical. That's the G part. How are we applying the revenue generated, which is the A part? How are we applying the revenue generated? Are we applying the revenue generated on things that are not going to build us? And then, and because we are going to have a decision to make on continuous basis between debt and taxation, because if you are not getting sufficient revenue from the tax side, you are getting into indebtedness. Then that means that ultimately, eh, you are already crippling the next generation because of that indebtedness. So with these are areas we have to have engagement to. Then finally, the productive utilization of the revenue. And I can assure you, these are conversations we've been having on consistent basis. But beyond conversation, back to your question, is the issue of engagement. And I'm aware, as a member of Association of Professional Bodies in Nigeria, that about two or three bodies presently are even in this conversation. We have joined them in that conversation. That has to do with debt profile and the issue of revenue generation. How do we ensure? And then the aspect of utilization again, because I was I mentioning that, you will see that we have other professional bodies again that are also strengthening us. You have the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria, for example. You have the Association of National Accountants of Nigeria. These are all the accounting bodies that will also help again in terms of this. And we are in conversation with them. We have MOU with Anna. We did a joint council meeting with Anna recently. And part of the issue that we came up with a communique addressed to the government about also has to do with issue of debt and issue of revenue. Because that was the essence of the council's focus. I'm talking about the Council of the Chartered of Taxation of Nigeria and the Council of the Association of National Accountants of Nigeria. So you will see that these are ongoing conversation we cannot stop talking about. Because ultimately, if you agree with me, you will see that the commercial nature of Lagos is being watered down. Most of those places we grow up, realizing them as commercial capitals, are not commercial capitals anymore. Because so many things bordering on policy needs to be addressed in order for us to be able to build the type of country we want to see. And beyond this issue of even companies going elsewhere or looking for the right climate to operate in, every time they go, something has happened. Jobs are lost. And the job that are lost makes them dependent relative on some of us who think we are working. I use the word, we think we are working. But the, at the end of the day, a lot of our resources is going to more or less like trying to sustain other people who have found themselves on the other side. So to just make that clear, we are having that conversation. But I agree with you. Let me put it on record. I agree with you that the level of conversation and engagement needs to be stepped up. I will step it up. Thank you, my president. So let's go ahead to, uh, yes, uh, I, I don't know who has the name. Uh, okay, Mr. Adejumo. Adejumo, are you there now? We are called, okay, yeah, you are there. Go ahead, sir. Yes. Good afternoon, Mr. President. Good afternoon. That is a great initiative. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm glad to be part of the Institute, to be a member. Yes, I quickly want to make a reference to what uh, this lady said the other time from Ghana, Priscilla. Are you there? Yeah, I'm yeah, there. I'm with you. Uh, you? Yes, I think uh, the angle she trying to look at is, um, from my own understanding or perspective, is that possibly somebody who is not a Nigerian can easily, possibly it's possible for them to come and write to the profession here and be a member of Nigeria, a minister of transition of Nigeria. Because like, uh, for instance, I have a friend some years back who came down from Cameroon to write an uh, icon, and when he passed, he moved back to Cameroon, and he's working with uh, PwC over there. I think uh, if it is a possibility for non-Nigerians who are interested to study Nigeria tax law and even practice here in Nigeria, or possibly trying to allies with other foreign uh, firms, companies who are 
out there in Europe or elsewhere in the world that they can be a consultant for them because they have an understanding and grounded in Nigeria tax law. I think that, that, that is the angle I believe she was looking at it. Okay. And secondly, my question is, what are we doing, the Institute is doing in terms of multiple taxations that is across Nigeria, even from the local government level, different rates, different levies here and there from one local government to the other. And this is adding more burden to the business, uh, the business people and other companies in doing business in Nigeria. So I don't know what the Institute is trying to do to mop up all this multiple tax transition that we're experiencing in this country. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Let me, uh, let me do a little bit of storytelling for the first question. Uh, all right, sir. When I was in Deloitte, my manager uh, happens to be a Ghanaian. He's oh. a member of CIT. Fantastic. And uh, uh, I was directly reporting to him. I was in Deloitte and I was in the tax section. And uh, I'm probably aware of one or two other people too who are Ghanaians who are members of the Institute. So if it is about non-Nigerians doing this exam, I can assure you we do not restrict on the basis of uh, 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 nationality because oh, okay. that's one. The only thing I did, I think the part of the question I think I got, which I thought was what she was alluding to, was whether we can have a center in Ghana so that that way they will have to talk about coming down to Nigeria. Uh, that was the area I said we have not addressed. So because the implication is that for most of this, for us to develop effectively and even play the big brother model, we must start looking at our student population anywhere we have a center, even within Nigeria. It is not in all the 36 states. You must be able to show us that the student population justify us moving to that area. Otherwise, we have no choice but to ask you to move to the nearest uh, capital where you can have the uh, examination conducted. So that's one. But in terms of that, I can assure you, we do not uh, uh, restrict anybody on the basis of nationality irrespective of where you are from, if you want to do our exam and you have the requisite qualification, we admit you. That's number one. Now, what are we doing on uh, multiple taxation? I can also tell you that some questions have been recurring. I just pray that we should be able to address it effectively. I know that I'm, I was a member of the uh, Task Policy Review Committee. And in that committee under the uh, uh, chairmanship of Professor Sonny, we debated, we discussed this. Eventually, the, what we came up with was, uh, was approved at the Federal Executive Council in 2017. And one of the challenges we, met, we highlighted and we addressed that we have a document to prove has to do with this issue of multiple taxation. And secondly, at various uh, institutional or organizational level, MAN has been on this, Manufacturers Association of Nigeria. NASIMA has been on the same issue. And as an institute, we cannot stop talking about this because ultimately, when it comes to those other areas, while we are mindful of the, of the fiscal federalism we are practicing and the fact that every uh, uh, revenue service has its own area of coverage for it, we must equally be mindful that it is a competitive world out there. And if it is a competitive world out there, we need to be mindful of the type of taxes some people pay vis-a-vis -vis the infrastructure we also need to also be providing. In some places, you don't be, don't be surprised, they pay even more taxes than we do. And they realize that in doing this, they are equally mindful of the fact that the government on its own side is doing one or two other issues. So while we are on this, I want to believe that is there are no great conversation, but taking your point that the engagement should probably be stepped up. I think a lot of the issues we have is not for lack of engagement, but there's a need for step up the engagement for that to get the desired outcome we are looking for. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, um, one of our members, um, there's a name, HP, HP something. Please, can you rename? We need you to get your, we need to get your name. Can you rename? 
why you are renaming? I mean, HPPC. Can't leave your name so I can get your name. So let's go back to Dr. Gosin Iro. Dr. Gosin Iro, uh, you know, you can speak. You have the floor with the president. Okay. Hello. Can Hello, you? can you? Hello, doctor. How are you? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. My president. Good day, sir. Good day. Uh, present the presenter. Thank you so much for what you are doing. Um, just a quick one. Uh, uh, every other one person has commended the institute. Uh, I also want to commend the institute for what is doing, especially leveraging on technology. I want you to keep it up. It is uh, it is the way to go. Um, the 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 other question I want to ask is. Uh, was is this institute actually um, prioritizing the imperative of broadening the tax base through engagement with FIRS and or, or JTV, especially ensuring that all taxable persons or entities are brought into the tax net? Uh, uh, I believe that in this way, the burden of tax on few uh, uh, tax compliant entities will ease off. Then I also Think, think about the issue of the development of task culture among the citizenry. Uh, what is this to doing, maybe in collaboration with either the government or other entities to ensure that this is pursued and emphasized? Because when the task culture is there, uh, people will no longer be seeing tax as a punitive measure, but just a civic responsibility. And when you pay your tax, uh, you walk boldly and you know that you are a patriotic uh, citizen. So what is being done about the tax culture? Uh, um, in the, uh, more importantly, the idea of emphasizing on um, um, voluntary compliance. Uh, I do know that when the citizens uh, um, feel that they are getting uh, value for you know, um, the taxes they are paying, probably in terms of accountability and transparency, that uh, task culture will de deepen. Thank you, my president. I hope uh, you got all my questions. Yes. Uh, thank you, my doctor. Uh, let me start with the first one. You said, uh, is CITN broadening the tax base through engagement with uh, FRS and KTB? Wow, let me put it this way. <laughs> the issue of uh, effective engagement with FRS, I can assure you the current leadership of FRS will quality double as a leader of a joint task board of which the Institute is a member. This is a conversation we cannot uh, stop engaging in. And then secondly, the area of technology, if you ask me, technology is the issue. And if I may just even give a little bit of a, a, a insight, we have this conversation at the level of a, even the use of policy and strategic studies. We have been having the conversation on continuous basis. You have so many uh, issues of identification. You have the uh, international passport, you have the driver's license, you have all these other ones. If I, even at the level of a uh, team, in some cases, you have one at JTB, you have one at uh, uh, some state level. So we are saying as much as possible, let's get this issue of technology right. And when we do get it right, we can easily start talking about identify, identifying. But since one cannot wait for the other, we have to move from known to the unknown. So we are struggling with the aspect of data, which we are gradually making progress with. I'm talking now from the JTB perspective, which the Institute is a member of. We are struggling with that and we are gradually making, the progress may not be fast, but it's a progress I can tell you all the same that is making it different from the way things are. We are engaging with other institutions. We are using the issue of exchange of information, all these, are part of the areas that is actually leading to a broad base revenue growth. So that's on that area. But we need to do better. Technology is not something we can run away from. If you run away from it in the morning, it will catch on away in the evening. So that's the truth. Because 
I remember when this issue of even uh, um, technology was coming in, at the level of public sector then, some people were using it to watch film, to watch movies. But it is gradually getting to a point where you'll be surprised if as a person you go to any place and they are trying to use typewriter to type a document for you. You'll be asking them, which world are they living in? So whether we like it or not, this is the future we are talking about. Is either we accept that future today or the future we catch us on our way tomorrow. So I agree with you that it is an engagement that it is a conversation that should be the first item on the agenda. And I want to believe that uh, your, your point in that regard is noted. Now, the second part of development of task culture, what is the Institute doing? You know, the Institute is not operating in the cloud. And I can, <laughs> and I can assure you that anytime we engage with people, on a, a task culture and they need to pay it. I mean, in some, in, in, closer to treasonable felony. <laughs> it is, you are operating in a country, you are asking the government to provide, are you doing your own part? Because if the searchlight is also put on you, eh, can you come out boldly and say, look, you are doing your part, let the government do its own. That is what we are trying to tell people because you get to some people, they will tell you they can complain about 1,001 things that are not done right. And I remember sometimes in the past when I was on tax matters, then the anchor asked me a simple question that with the issue of lack of provision of a lot of this thing by the government, do I still want to encourage people to pay tax? And I did a simple analogy there. I said, can you imagine a lawless society as a result of failure to pay this? You just imagine, if you are operating in Lagos, where I'm talking from now, imagine a situation where the police are withdrawn from the society. Even if you say you are not satisfied with what they are doing, let's just imagine a situation they were totally withdrawn from the society just for 24 hours. What do you think will happen in Lagos? The bad boys will take control. And all of us will realize it is a total failure of government. So if it is not, if we do not want such scenario happening, then let us move from whether we call it a not so good police to the good police we are desirous of. Because it is clear that we already have a product. Let us make that product desirable. So that is the way I see it. So task culture is something that we are presently having a conversation with FRS to make sure that we do not operate in silos. If CITN, our objective may be developing the task profession, while their own is talking about task revenue, but the right professional will help them to get to the level of revenue they are desirous of having. So we are not working at cross purposes. We should be working from that angle. So we need to actually come together and create this task culture while at the same time engaging with government on the aspect of governance, accountability, and productive use. is a continuous conversation. And that is my response on the task culture aspect. I appreciate you for that uh, comment, and I think I will take it further beyond here. I tell you, Mr. President, um, Dr. Ero, I guess I've really not been able to do justice to your, um, to, your, to your question and also to your observation. Let's go to Dr. Mark Abani. Dr. Mark Abani, you have the floor. Dr. Thank you. Thank you very. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you very much, my president. Uh, really, you, really interesting <laughs> discussion taking place. Um, now, I agree uh, completely with what you're saying, and I'd like to re-emphasize certain points. Um, one is that a number of states are doing some measures, and the federal government are doing some measures, trying to relate tax to services provided to make a direct link in taxpayers' minds that their money is being used. For instance, I think it's Governor Omiko uh, who actually publishes the amount of money that they make from revenue and the projects that they are being put into so that you can see cause and effect. Because the problem is the breakdown of the social contract between the people and government. I've, I've lived, I worked, I worked at a very senior level in the Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. I was paying tax at 50%. You pay those taxes when you know 
that the money is being spent for services that benefit you and other people and your families by extension. So that social contract, we really need to work on it continuously. Uh, some of the states are doing it already. We need to try and, and, and help push them. In terms of expanding the tax net, a lot of work has been done with all of the states uh, on property tax uh, under the SIFTAS, the State Transparency and Accountability Framework of the World Bank. Uh, and almost every state has got hundreds of thousands of properties now fully enumerated, including names of taxpayers. And that database is a very rich source of verifiable data to expanding the tax net. I work new with many, many states, and I can tell you that the number of taxpayers registered have moved from the hundreds, and in a few cases from the thousands to hundreds of thousands, and in a couple of states to millions. The data still needs to be cleaned, to be made worthwhile, but the data is being collected, and it's all of our duties to help provide this sort of data. And then finally, I'd like to throw a challenge to all my professional colleagues, and perhaps to the CITN, and I don't know the answer, it may be required already. Is a tax clearance certificate required to renew your practicing license as a professional tax advisor? If not, we need to put it inside there. You cannot be advising other people on the tax they should pay if you have not got your own TCC and the Institute is not looking at it. Because I'm sorry to say that a lot of us, a lot of us do not pay anywhere near the basic minimum amount of tax that we should be paying as taxpayers ourselves. But we come out and in typical manner, we point the finger at other people forgetting that we are also guilty. So let's try to put some things in place that will force us as an institute to start to live by those values that we're talking about. And at the very minimum, for those who are wanting to advise with a practice license, they should be able to convince the institute that they have paid their own personal tax before they can advise others. Uh, I rest my case on that, perhaps provocative. Uh, uh, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, sir. I think um, you've, uh, you've actually uh, shed more light on a lot of issues, especially this aspect, and I agree with you in totality that the issue of social contract is the area that we should be talking about strengthening further. And the aspect that borders, of course, and the fact that we gave one or two case studies about uh, something that we should desire to be. Now, the, the almighty question of whether the Institute requires a task plan before you renew practice license. <laughs> I can tell you as I did, is a no. <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> but I use the word but for you to come into council as a as council, if you are electing to come into council, we demand that. That's because at the governance level. But the one that borders on the practice license, I will take it back to my council and <laughs> tell them that that is something we can use again to help the standard to show that the practitioners we have maybe uh, are the people who are uh, compliant. Yes. with their obligations. And so they have the moral duty to serve as advisors. That would be a beautiful thing to see the position of council by the time I put it there. But since I cannot speak for council, I will be talking as the president. I will bring this particular beautiful thing to council for us to deliberate on. Thank you very much, sir. I appreciate thank you. you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Dr. Makabani, for that insight and contribution. Now, um, you note there are some comments that have been made in the chat concerning the um, administrative issue concerning secretariat. We are noting them, all those who ask for the no certain payment, they didn't get service. Um, the MPTP credits, all of those are an issue. They are going to be funneled and sent to the department who will get across to you. So take it from us. So uh, all of those administrative issues, um, you know, I've got this recorded um, program and um, this stream live. So all of those issues are being noted. They will be sure the relevant department who will that, you know, that will get across to every single administrative issue raised. So I go over to Mr. Olufola. Shokenu, are you there? Mr. Olufela, Olufela, sorry. Olufela Shokenu, are you there? 
Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, my president. Good afternoon, Lord Gafela. Yes, sir. Yes. My question, let me first react to the last caller before I ask my question. Now, concerning the task clearance certificate, as an enterprise, you don't have task clearance certificate, but you only have receipts as evidence of payment. So I don't know how the institute can verify task clearance certificate or receipts from people. That's one. That's just a little reaction that I want to make. Then the, my question is this, of late, uh, the, those that have just registered businesses with CAC, they give them team from start. Now they find it difficult to register, I mean, to, uh, to have bank, you know, to open bank accounts. Why? Because the thing in the bank, they will say the thing does not match. Meanwhile, that's the thing from the CAC. So they can't open bank accounts. So I don't know what the institute can do to streamline you know, this thing uh, issue. And also, you don't even know where the task station is. They can give you, you can open, you are in Lagos and they give you a thing that is you know, in Abuja. You have to do redirection. And before you can do redirection, it means you have to visit Abuja. Meanwhile, you are in Lagos. So uh, there should be a synergy, you know, between CAC and the uh, FIRS. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Ogafela. Uh, um, let, me, let me address them one after the other. Yes. Uh, talking about practitioners who are using maybe enterprise, I don't know what has changed in some other uh, location. In some places, when you request for task clearance and you are using the name of your parties to request for that CCC, they will give you a task clearance and they will write your name doing business as, like a DBA, doing business as this, this, and this associate or whatever. So that way, somebody can connect your name with the enterprise you are getting that for. So that is a connecting link. So in some places, like I said, the tax administrative level is not evenly developed in all the 36 states. So maybe there are challenges in some other areas. That's number one. Then number two, the issue of um, team at the point of incorporation. It is a good point to have just raised there. Unfortunately, we have, uh, and I think is this actually under um, Dr. Mark Abani, because I'm sure he's a coordinating dean. We have uh, one of the faculties that has to do with this issue of task administration. We may need to actually look at that and be able to engage FRS on the challenges people are going through. It is part of, if you are talking about part of ease of doing business, when people are going through stress, just to talk about task and education number, that may not be speaking well for us as a nation. So this is an area where we may take up and then engage with the FRS on it. Thank you for bringing that to our notice. Thank you, Mr. President. That is, um, yes, Adeoba. I'm John. You can uh, unmute and speak, please. Adeoba, I'm John. Yes. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon, President. And good afternoon. Good afternoon. I hear you loud and clear. We can hear you. Go ahead. We are listening. Okay, Ms. Ross, let's go to Adeshola. Adeshola, you may unmute and speak. Good afternoon, my president, sir. Good afternoon. Yes, sir. Well done, sir. Good afternoon, Professor Michael. It's time to shed more light. Seen coming. Yes, I said uh, on the. Hello? Hello. Uh, okay, are you back online? We lost you and took someone else. Okay, please, let's come back to you. Uh, uh, Ms. Adeshola, I can go ahead. Ms. Adeshola, I can go ahead. We'll come back to Mr. Adeshola. Okay, can you hear me now, sir? Yes, we can. Loud and clear, we can. Okay, my president, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. 
Yeah, well done for the well job done. We really appreciate this opportunity of having the direct interaction with you. It really means that the institution really wants to, to do better and also have the opinion of the society. Uh, my question, let me go straight to my question, is that, is there any, any plan? I, I, I think now CITN is doing well that anybody that has not been even into the accounting uh, accounting sector can start from anywhere from foundation and master well in taxation in Nigeria taxation. But I discover that many people, even after having CITN certificate being chartered, they they still find it difficult to get their, themselves into the FRS sector. What I, what do I mean? When there is recruitment. I think they're supposed to be on the top lists of people they're going to employ. So is there any, anything CITN is trying to do with FRS to make sure that by the time people get chartered with the institutes, they, they get first priority to be employed into FRS because I think that's, that's the, the major reason of going into the institute, sir. That's my question. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I think um, I can take it this way. The question is equally an observation and a recommendation, if I have to put it that way. Uh, the challenge we used to have, I want to believe that is behind us, beyond the issue of the politics and whatever this thing we want to talk about. The fact remains that initially, sometimes ago, we had this issue of how did members become, how did somebody become a member? That was the initial challenge. We've gone beyond that, I think, some administration ago. Now, today, what we now need to do, because apart from FRS, Federal Land Revenue Service, I'm aware of some states, they've called my attention to that. That has to do with the level of attention being paid to our members is not encouraging. And we are talking about their core areas because the core areas of somebody who read tasks, who is working in the public sector, is to work in state internal revenue services and federal revenue services. So if you are not well recognized in the area where you are supposed to be an expert, where else will they recognize you? That becomes a question. Because this is an area where everything you do from morning till evening is all about tasks. You start in the morning, you are thinking tasks. You are close in the evening, you are thinking of nothing but tasks. So it is not something we want to, uh, to actually accommodate. At the FRS level, like I said, we have a good relationship with that. And I think it's also something I can easily have a one-on-one -on -one engagement with the Sherman Federal Land Revenue Service on that. At the JTB level, where you are talking about all the states, I'm aware of some, like Delta, for example, the impression I have, except I have anything to the contrary, is that anybody with uh, CITN is given a priority. But I'm aware of some states, I won't want to mention their names, where I still have a, some job, to, some issue to resolve there relating to the importance they are giving to our members who have this certification. So I want to agree with you that in all the 36 states, I don't have it all caught, I mean, all in my favor. So in the few states where I'm having issues. I think there are those states I need to start engaging with to be able to engage with the leadership and ensure that this is done. And because one, as of today in this country, it is CITN that has the regulatory rights for purpose of the issue of tasks. We don't do anything but tasks. In the morning, we are talking tasks. In the afternoon, we are talking tasks. In the evening, we are talking tasks. So who else, again, would you want to be in that department if not somebody who does not think of any other thing for taxation? So I agree with you. I take the aspect of your recommendation seriously. And I hope that by the time I'm going to have the next engagement with you, I will have more uh, uh, beautiful story to tell relating to this. I take it as part of the job you have given me before the next one. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. Um, yes, um, we are going to go ahead to Mr. Kola Oladeroba. Mr. Kola Oladeroba, are you there? You may need to speak. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. We can hear you clearly. Okay. We can. 
Good, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Yes, my name is Adirog Bakulawale from Abuja. Okay. Yeah, my question, I've sent the question to, the, um, to you already, but I can now restate it. It's concerning the uh, FRS and the public. Uh, some of them, they say that they are doing investigation as per an industry. We, what we are now saying is that after the investigations, what is actually the outcome? They're supposed to call the industry and the stakeholders together to inform them about what they have discovered in that industry. Are they doing the accounting right, the tax computations? What are the things that industry is not doing right or they are doing right which need to be corrected? Because we are saying that it's not supposed to be everything about issue of uh, you are, uh, they are paying uh, tax, 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 but that industry, how is that industry faring in terms of sending their return, doing everything right? That's what I want the Institute to take up with the uh, FRS so that they can organize a kind of stakeholder of that industry, inviting them and also discuss with them what they have discovered after their investigation. That's my question. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Adiroba. That's a wonderful question. In fact, uh, it's a question I will really uh, take as even my first priority. Now, let me, let me do a little bit of background to show my understanding of your question. I recall vividly that at the level of audit, what it means is that somebody is actually asking you to let us know we found out this as per your book. The auditor said that this is the difference. So what exactly is the cause of the variance? That's the level of audit. But at the level of investigation, it means at that point in time, it is like your account cannot be relied on. Your financial statement is unreliable. And because it is unreliable, investigation has to come in and come up with what should really be the outlook of your performance. And it is a serious one. So in terms of that seriousness, it could be as a result of the wrong treatment of certain things, which you are not doing right. And that is why I agree with you. Without necessarily mentioning specifics, who says we cannot go out and say that in this particular industry, what has been observed as practitioners or as professionals is that this is the way you are treating this particular item. And it is not consistent with the reality of the substance of that transaction even while as, uh, acknowledging the treatment from my FRS, you can match the two. This is IFRS treatment, this is what we expect from you. Is it an added requirement? Put it there so that it will guide the tax office. So such things should be the way to go. I agree with you on that. And naturally, since the ob objective of FRS is for you to do it right, so that they will not need to spend resources conducting investigation, because for every investigation you talk about, resources would have gone. They would have taken time, the number of days, the level of engagement and the rest. So if you can uh, do education for you to get it right, then we may not need to actually conduct investigation. That's when as we are talking. I accept your recommendation in that regard. We should be able to make it an investigation education model so that as we are investigating, the members of the public are getting more educated. And therefore, we are helping you to reduce the cost of your governance too, indirectly. Because once we get it right, we pay the right amount, then we, we won't have to talk about going through investigation for you to cash us. We would have done it right at the first attempt. I agree with you. Thank you very much for that. And I will take it up. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. We have another member here um, who has um, um, come on to make with additional Hassan. Additional Hassan. You may unmute and speak with um, the President. Mr. Yeah, thank you very much. Are you hearing me? We can hear you. Clearly. Okay, thank you very much, my, um, my president. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, presentation. The, the word of encouragement you have given to every one of us. Today. We've actually been enlightened very well. But there's an observation that I just want to, uh, to, to bring to your notice. Recently, Lagos State brought out a, the e-filing. E, e and then uh, Tango is a wonderful uh, platform that, uh, as it may be now, but I observe something. They, when you come out and then you put up your filing, you file, and then you are to pay. 
there's some certain stage they will tell you, okay, you the, the filing is, is is shortfall or something like that. And the question I asked, how do you get to know that this uh, thing is uh, we have a shortfall? They said they have already sent a sort of calculation to you, which is right, and then you have done your own calculation to which is normal. You, I mean, com computing PYE, PYE, you can do it manually. Now, the question is that the calculation you sent, how did you get it? I was made to understand that the use projection you made at the beginning of the year to do the, 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 the calculation. The question is this, and I asked them, if you are using projection, if I say I'm going to increase my staff salary by 10% beginning of the year, and then the economy did not allow me, and then I, did not, I did not increase it, must you now use projection? Because projection is not actual. But we, we seem to be disagreeing on, on, on things. I think if you use your, you, you, I actually appreciate if you can use your office to, 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 to bring them to, to bring this to their notice. There's no way you can make a project someone made the beginning of the year that throughout this year, I'm going to pay my, I'm going to increase this, uh, my staff salary, so so percentage. It's just a projection. You cannot use this one to compute my tax and you expect me to be paying every month. So that is just the, the observation I'm bringing to your notice. Yeah, it's a thank wonderful. You. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Deshin uh, Let me let me also I'm a little bit of a, um, let me do a little bit of storytelling too again while trying to address this. You see, the I had an encounter some years past with somebody, an inspector at the level of uh, FRS, and what was the encounter about it has to do with the model the business model of the company we are talking about this company earns commission technically commission is what they earn as their income and in the course of uh, uh, maybe disclosing how the commission was arrived at they mentioned the basis on which that commission was given to them now, when the FRS inspector was engaging in this, he looked at the aspect of the basis of the commission and was using it as a basis of the tax liability of that company. I had to make it, you must first have a good understanding of the business model for you to be able to know how this company generates its income. That was one. Now, the one you just mentioned has to do with projection. Projection is about you assuming that, if, I mean, you may even do your projection on the basis of faith. You may be believing God for a miracle <laughs> that your business is going to grow. And then the reality at the end of the year was that as a result of the challenges, the falling currency rate, so many factors, even a particular branch may even be closed down. And then you are now seeing the reality. Your projection was done in January. Your reality is in December. Naturally, that should be the basis on which anybody can talk about looking at you, whether you have paid the right thing based on the income you earn between January and December. And not necessarily on the basis of your projection that could be faith-based or the most optimistic scenario you are looking at. So I agree with you on that area, but I may need to get my facts right. So on the basis of uh, fact finding, while I agree with you in principle first, on the basis of fact finding, fortunately, the State Internal Revenue Service is a walking distance from the Institute. I will get my facts and then I will intervene as appropriately on the basis of the need, the right thing to be done so that that way we do not create a situation where people are now talking about a liability that is non existent. So that is my response to that. And thank you very much for bringing this also to my notice. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Marco, can we um, open up the chat? We have um, one or two chats. Can we open up? Let's see whether there are um, uh, non um, secretarial issue we need to address. Someone is asking, my question has to do with my recent encounter. Uh, please, uh, what percentage of VAT should be deducted from a contract that was consummated, executed, and concluded in 2019? but not paid until 2022, 5% or 7.5%.
If you want me to answer that question, then where do you want my people to get job from? Oh, wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> because I'm talking, so if you are not, uh, that means if you are, get in touch with a task practitioner and make this case available so that that way it can advise you appropriately on the right way to go. Because you see, once I start answering that, it will come back to what even some of my members are saying. By the time the institute is going into the realm of the task practitioner, then you won't need a task practitioner to provide the answers for you on this. So <laughs> I, will have, I, I will give it, please talk to a task practitioner. One of us, he will give you the right answer. <laughs> Thank you, Robert. Thank you so much. Yeah, we are always coming to the end of this program. Um, Robert, can you sneak in a clarity? I said that the progression of course I wanted to ask, I asked about the examination process of this, the integrity of the examination. Now, having passed the exam, become a member, but what is the work on the certificate in terms of job, FRS, SRS, private sector, those going to consulting. Now, in the third leg and final, what is the institute doing with respect to try to empower its member in the area of um, tax premiership and to relationship around the concept and premium of taxation? Because not everyone is in a paid job. Not everyone, some of our members, their you know, obligations, um, subscription, and all of that have not been so up to date. Is the interest thinking in that regard to create a scheme or something, a program that can um, you know, fire off the entrepreneurship possibilities with additional protection? Thank Quickly you. Before we are done. Yes, I mean, if, if I you gave me the, the icing on the cake, and uh, as, as usual, in my storytelling, this thing, I'm aware of the time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, uh, I've been a practitioner for the last 20 years in terms of practicing. And I realized that part of the errors, part of the initial errors I made is this aspect of not immediately connecting my professionalism with entrepreneurship. And I can assure you that a lot of us are, are doing tax hobby, not tax professionalism. Because it's like we are, we are just doing something that we cannot really sit down and ask ourselves, are you really an entrepreneur from the perspective of that understanding? So to me, in terms of answering this specifically, we need to deliberately and intentionally start connecting the profession with a business model, that clear understanding that this is a business on its own. Honestly, it is a business on its own that if we have that clear understanding about this, we will know how to do our staffing, how to do our marketing within the ambit of ethical uh, and uh, professional consideration. How, what type of engagement you should be engaging in. Do you know the irony of it all, to make it clear, even on the aspect of the marketing? Some of the conversation we have in public space is what makes some people to want to actually engage us as a consultant. In some places, as simple as even a Rotary Club, you may be asked to talk about a um, uh, job talk, and then you mention what you have been able to do one or two areas, and the next thing, somebody, about three or four of them may be interested in even engaging you as a consultant. So if you do not have a clear understanding of what type of marketing model you can do, since you cannot do that Indomie type on the TV, then you must have your own style of marketing that should be talking about what you can do as a person. So that way, the entrepreneurship needs to be integrated into our model in order for us to make sure that our members who are not in the state revenue service are able to get the benefit of it. Thank you very much. Before I, before I, over, <laughs> I overuse my <laughs> time. Thank you, Dr. So President. It's been nice. It's been fun speaking to the 15 presidents of the Chapter of the of Nigeria and the President traditional at the MNI, FCTI, um, Chairman of Council as well. Um, colleagues, friends, members out there, non-members of CITN. Um, we thank you for being with us for the past two hours. It has been so detailed, so revealing. Thank you for joining us in this uh, episode. We look forward to subsequent quarters when the president will continue this interaction on State of the Institute. Thank you all.